All right, I'm going to assume we are good. So I'm going to kick this off. Uh, hello and welcome to our second online event for the fall 2020 academic year here at the China and the World Program based at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University in New York City. My name is Daniel Sahensky, the Deputy Director of the China and the World Program. Before I introduce today's speaker, let me remind everyone to submit questions in the comment box of the YouTube thread that you're watching this on right now, and we will do our best uh, to answer as many of those questions as possible as we move through this event. Also, before we begin, I'd like to thank the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for helping us co-host this event. This is on their channel. Uh, they've helped us an enormous amount over this event and the previous event, uh, getting all of the online components up and ready for the China and the World Program. Uh, and specifically, a special shout out to uh, Athena, who has been instrumental in this process. Um, Tom Christensen, who is normally a part of these conversations, is feeling a little bit under the weather, non-COVID related. He should be back with us for tomorrow's event. Just wanted to give everyone a heads up. Um, today, we will be talking about a new book about China's Belt and Road Initiative over the last 20 years. To help us understand what's going on and to discuss some of these topics more fully, we are thrilled to welcome Min Ye. Min Ye is an associate professor of international relations at the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University. Her research sits at the nexus between domestic and global politics and the intersection of economics and security with a focus on China, India, and regional relations. Her three recent book publications include The Belt and Road and Beyond, State Mobilized Globalization in China from 1998 to 2018 from Cambridge University Press that was released earlier this year in February, uh, right before all the funds started. Uh, second book is Diasporas and Foreign Direct Investment in China and India from Cambridge University Press in 2014. And finally, The Making of Northeast Asia, Stanford University Press in 2010. Vignette has received numerous grants and fellowships in the United States and Asia over her career, including the Smith Richardson Foundation Grant, East Asia Peace, Prosperity and Governance Fellowship, Millennium Education Scholarship in Japan. And from 2014 to 2016, she was the Public Intellectuals Fellow. And most recently in 2020, she is the Rosenberg Scholar of East Asian Studies at Suffolk University. Finally, and most notably, Vignette was the 2009-2010 Fellow with our program, the China and the World Program, uh, which we are very, very proud to welcome her back as a guest. Um, Minya, it seems that uh, there are, are quite a, a lot of questions or inundated with information recently about China, uh, given how everything has sort of gone over the last years. Can you help us make sense of the BRI in a global context during your lecture? Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. Um, and welcome uh, any questions uh, that Dan would share with me. And uh, I, I'll uh, be sure to uh, share my email and contacts uh, for any scholars who want to uh, continue the conversation. Um, so I prepared uh, uh, a talk, a slides. Should I just uh, share now, Dan? Okay. Yeah, that'd be great if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Okay, so uh, if, if the audio or video is not clear, please let me know. I'm sure Dan will be on the other end making sure that it sounds all right and uh, it, it looks okay. Um, so uh, I, I want to thank Athena and Dan for uh, organizing this event, uh, but I do want to start by um, uh, 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 saying a couple words ab about uh, CWP. Uh, my association with CWP uh, it was very early. Um, so it, it's been uh, uh, since 2004 as it started in Princeton. And of course, the 2009, 2010, I got this much appreciated uh, year long postdoc fellowship to complete uh, the book on China and India. But this book, uh, The Belt Road and Beyond, that's actually, I feel like it's more CWP book uh, product or my um, uh, scholarly 
Korea. Uh, not only the subject is very much uh, China and the world, uh, but also over the years from 2013 all the way to 2019 and now, uh, and this year, I had so much uh, e uh, exchange and conversation uh, with CWP fellows, uh, friends, alums, and the two uh, the best directors ever, uh, Tom Christensen and uh, Ian Johnston. Um, so they, they are just a, such a great uh, uh, mentor and um, and and <laughs> um, So uh, for any uh, young scholars um, and uh, uh, the, uh, senior scholars who have junior colleagues or students, um, uh, I, I just want to let you know that this is the best fellowship ever and the network, the conversation um, and, and the kinds of support uh, we receive individually is just, uh, uh, it's, it's very extensive and lasting. Uh, so uh, with, uh, with that, I will, I will start my uh, uh, conversation today. So I will mostly uh, spend the time on introducing the book, uh, but uh, uh, without gloating, uh, I have to say the details are in the book and uh, it's the detail that's fascinating about China and about the BRI. So uh, uh, I hope you guys in today's talk kind of an overview and uh, you can pick uh, you guys uh, participants uh, to read the, the, the book. Um, and so when we think about the BRI, I think the common image are the, are on, are the, on the screen, right? So you see these uh, uh, lines uh, uh, connecting China on land to Europe, and that's the Silk Road Economic Belt. And then the blue line connecting China on the sea, um, and that's the Maritime Silk Road. And then uh, in addition, there are a few uh, uh, very strategic economic corridors connecting China with South, with South Asian countries. And on top of that, uh, most of uh, researchers and scholars focus on these uh, uh, strongholds, right, the, the ports, um, the major uh, uh, infrastructure projects. Um, so these are what I uh, call outside in approach, uh, uh, studying Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, frankly, when I started my research in 2014, uh, later 2013 and 2014, I was also outside in. And then uh, as I went into China uh, and I quickly uh, uh, realized that uh, it was uh, a lot of rhetoric, um, but the reality uh, in outside China was really lagging and, and very different. And, and rather inside China, uh, the, 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 the dynamics that were unleashed by uh, the BRI uh, in, uh, in, in Beijing, uh, among the central governments, among uh, think tank scholars, uh, among um, uh, other major state-owned companies, the banks uh, and then the, the local governments uh, in various Chinese cities in the localities, that dynamics is really just uh, striking, right? Um, so I decided that um, this, the internal story uh, is more significant for the BRI. And eventually the map as I show here, um, the BRI is really about China. Uh, it's uh, uh, down by the Chinese uh, uh, actors. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it, it fits the Chinese model. And uh, here I will, I will uh, try to share today that the, the BI in, in China is not the only one. It's not the last one. It's also not the first one uh, what I call the state mobilized globalization. So eventually um, uh, the, the book went back to uh, study the Chinese uh, uh, globalization from the late 1990s to, to 2018. And uh, I uh, employ um, the, the, uh, the, a scholarship that had uh, many uh, 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 generations of studies in the China field that focus on the Chinese state. But the, the way I look at the Chinese state in this book is a more holistic 
right? It's a more holistic and integral uh, framework. I see the Chinese state as a system that has uh, three blocks. Um, and, and of course, it's very complex, but I think these three blocks kind of uh, offer a balanced way to capture the, um, the complexity of the Chinese state system and while also kind of doable. I, I, you can employ to study real policy uh, uh, drivers, implementation and outcome uh, in China. Uh, and so the first block is a uh, party leadership. So you, we have the Chinese uh, uh, individual leader, and then you will have the uh, permanent members or the standing members of the party bureau and then the central committee and then the uh, in terms of major domestic and foreign policy the party organ is more leading groups right so that's a party block and then the uh, in 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 the middle, that's a large Chinese bureaucracy, right? so led by the state council. But uh, um, under this, there were dozens, there are dozens of uh, 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 ministries, um, and they they uh, operate uh, rather autonomously from the state council. Um, so that's the second block. And then the last one, the most numerous and also on the ground implementers of most of policies in China, um, that's the supranational actors, uh, the local governments and, uh, and, and state owned companies. Right? And, and the relationship, I see them uh, as uh, mutually influencing, you know, so that's by, uh, by the institutional design and also by practice. So the structure, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, is a uh, fragmented in authority and also in the policy process. And uh, the party's role, and we know the Chinese party as a single ruling party is very powerful, but it's, uh, it's importance uh, over the state and uh, over local governments uh, more at the organizational and ideolo ideological level. So they control the messaging and, uh, and also through the appointment systems uh, over the bureaucracy and subnational actors. Uh, but beyond uh, those organization and ideology and, and major policies in China then are done by the state agency and by the subnational actors. So uh, the last uh, thing that about the state system uh, is uh, the kind of three-tiered ideology that I observe uh, in this process. Uh, again, uh, I'm not experts on nationalism, but from uh, looking at the, the different uh, grand strategies in China, and uh, I find that at the most abstract, the highest level, it's the nationalism, you know, how it pertains to rise of China, modernization of China, overall wealth, prosperity of China, the place of China in the world, you know, so there's much more abstract um, uh, nationalist ideals. And then the, uh, at the bureaucratic level, it's really the developmentalism, you know, uh, industry, employment, uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, economic growth, and that those developmentalism are the most sweeping concerns. And at the bottom, uh, local governments and companies largely follow uh, market uh, uh, expansion and the commercial uh, tendencies and the drives. So that's that that's more like uh, uh, accumulated over China's own uh, uh, experience and then became kind of um, uh, systematically formulated uh, in the in the state system. Right. Then going back to uh, the, the the policy. And the grand strategy or the national strategy, and in the Chinese uh, translation, is the uh, the it, uh, it, it, uh, national strategy. So when we uh, look at the, uh, China and look at the strategy, we see the the, the strategy, the rhetoric of the strategy, uh, and and then we see the uh, political leadership who was um, announcing or promoting uh, uh, on various occasions, right? And so those are uh, common uh, stories that we know. And here in this book, uh, I uh, go back to the, the context uh, and the process of 
these needs uh, that drive the uh, leadership announcing the strategy. So prior to the strategy, um, I uh, look at the, the state bureaucratic level and coalitional level where, uh, to evaluate the various uh, pressures, crises felt uh, in the economic realm, in the diplomatic realm, and the geostrategic realm uh, in, in China. And uh, of course, the, the state bureaucracies uh, had uh, been dealing with issues before. Right? Uh, but uh, in uh, the background, our grand strategies uh, 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 promulgation in China, it's typically the bureaucracies were uh, incapacitated. And in the, uh, so there was clear state paralysis either due to political repression, uh, different campaigns, or uh, too divided uh, the bureaucracy was over the national direction. Uh, of, uh, so that, that gives opportunity, but also propelled the leadership to intervene. And then uh, that's less important to me than how uh, the policy was really and actually being implemented and uh, um, interpreted by these implementers. Right? So uh, on the uh, right end of this process, then uh, I look at the different bureaucracies or uh, industries and how they uh, self-interpret and in reinterpret um, the, the, the national strategy and local governments and companies, how they employ the strategy to achieve their pre-existing uh, uh, development or commercial uh, 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 drives, right? um, and that they were the that that was one logic. So the fragmented implementation, but typically um, in the Chinese uh, uh, policy cycle, uh, the, they always create problems, no matter what kind of uh, perfect uh, strategy they. So they, so China never want, uh, was never uh, intending uh, or even uh, uh, hoping to. Uh, Pass perfect uh, policy because in the on the ground they always have problems. Right? So so the the anticipated and the 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 last end of the policy where well, there'll be lots of problems and creating backlash, vulnerability, risk. So the feedback loop would happen after the fragmented implementation and then going back to the. The, um, the state bureaucracy and the political leadership, we begin to see policy recalibration. So this is a, a rather cyclical uh, policy framework that captures uh, China's BRI, but more importantly, it's a recent but significant uh, 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 national strategies um, that I will uh, also cover today. Right. So the empirical studies, I uh, largely have three dimensions. Um, the first one is temporal, right? So I, uh, BRI was new. Uh, in particular, I started to uh, research on BRI since its announcement, right? So it's moving and it's evolving. But uh, before BRI in China, uh, the, the, the Chinese leader uh, announced the Western Development Program in 1999, and, uh, um, and it, it lasted at least, uh, it's actually still very significant today. And after COVID, the Western Development Program actually took on new uh, vitality and emphasis. Um, uh, but, in, in, so, but, but here in this particular chapter on WDP, I ended uh, in 2012 because after 2012, the WDP uh, emphasis, focus and projects were kind of subsumed by the BI. Right? Um, and then the second uh, 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 the strategy was that uh, China goes global announced by uh, uh, President uh, Jiang Zemin in 2000, um, where as China was preparing to join the World Trade Organization, right? And in, in, to, to, the, to, to, to Beijing, that was, was, they were opening the floodgate and they were anticipating lots of pressure and, and, uh, and uh, potential risk. So the China Goes Global was efforts to mobilize uh, Chinese local governments and companies to, to find um, uh, restructuring and revitalization uh, programs. 
And that one, uh, I, it's again, it's still ongoing, um, but uh, basically I covered 2000 to 2015. And then the BRI, uh, I basically uh, studied the whole cycle, uh, uh, the period before, and then from its launch in late 2013, and then to 2018. The, then the uh, second layer, I look at the national state dimension. And here uh, in all these uh, uh, strategies, uh, in particular in the BRI, so I look at the uh, political leadership, their, their rhetoric, their political priorities, um, and, uh, and how they were promoting this uh, national strategy. And then the second, um, uh, uh, parts are the with are the bureaucracies and uh, the the various uh, coalitional interest groups that were associated with different bureaucracies, and the book um, spends a lot of time on the sub national dimension too. Um, so in all these chapters on the uh, WDP, China CGG, and uh, BRI, um, uh, uh, in the implementation, I. I uh, inevitably had to cover how different localities, how these policies were interpreted and implemented locally. But in the book, I also have two uh, chapters exclusively focused on the local uh, analysis or subnational analysis. Right? So the first is uh, localities. I compare uh, uh, different cities in China and according to their uh, different uh, political economic um, um, framework, right? So state capital led and uh, government led and versus uh, a more liberal uh, market dominated city. Uh, and then companies, I also compare uh, the uh, companies by their ownership structure and uh, by different sectors. So it's uh, on, folks on their BRI, but also uh, thinking about their own growth in China and the globalization uh, in, in the recent two, two decades. Right? So, um, and that's, that's really interesting uh, uh, investigation that I have to, I, I did in, in China. Um, now, uh, I will uh, provide uh, some uh, summaries on, on the findings. So the first uh, question, for example, I asked was, why did a Chinese leader launch the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013? Right? Um, I did not uh, have any chance talking to any people who were directly making the policy, but I was able to talk to uh, a very uh, a, a, a array of think tanks and uh, 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 bureaucratic officials um, and uh, the, the, the interviews and as well as documentary uh, writings, uh, speeches that, that confirm this logical uh, uh, ca causal story. Uh, one is um, uh, uh, China had faced uh, major geostrategic tension in maritime China, uh, in maritime Asia in particular, the US-China competition was uh, really uh, encircling over China. Um, so the um, uh, policy uh, proposal was China goes west to deflect US-China confrontation. And so the strategic uh, origin was to move away from the hotspots and the go on the land. Um, and then uh, uh, dip diplomatic actors, and they've been dealing with problems in the region for years. And what they came up was uh, infrastructure um, diplomacy. Um, the, the, the term they, they used was uh, uh, mutual connectivity. Right. Uh, and then the uh, more important uh, driver uh, here is, is the industrial overcapacity. So China uh, experienced a very severe overcapacity starting 2011. Uh, and the technocrats, the financiers, the banks, they were proposing um, the uh, Chinese Marshall Plan to divert uh, the uh, Chinese resources to help Chinese industry 
globalized, right? Um, then none of them were uh, acceptable either across the government or to society. Like the Chinese Marshall Plan, once they were raised in Chinese um, uh, domestic uh, uh, the, the, the arena, and uh, the, the popular criticism was very severe. Right? So the, the common uh, view was, why you should spend the money overseas, right? So that's that's typical of China as a middle-income uh, country. Although we see that as a as a giant, but they them, see themselves still a middle-income uh, uh, developing country. Right? Uh, and so the uh, again, why why question to me is less important than the how question. Right? So how did the uh, uh, the uh, Chinese state and the business implement the BI. So again, I follow the state system that I formulated in the beginning. And as I look at the different national agencies and, and what were their uh, uh, documents and uh, policy moves or budgets or mechanism, whether they pass any of those, right? So the agencies and then local governments and they, they all have uh, uh, come up with their BII plan. So it's kind of interesting to see uh, what are their plans, but, but that part actually only going to the local and talking to different people, you, you get to see um, the plan is one thing, they copy one plan from another, uh, but it's really the, 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 the lo lo in the locality, you see what are the main dynamics of implementation. And then state capital, uh, uh, the SOEs and the banks, and they have different experiences as well. So I kind of follow that formula to uh, go around uh, China to look for answers. So what are the outcomes? And I think this was um, often asked uh, and often uh, given answer is, is it successful or not successful? Is it failing or was it achieving the Chinese goals? Um, so I, I always say it's not that simple, right? Um, because the, the, the Chinese goals, they have long-term uh, and if the goal is about um, the uh, uh, revitalize or mobilize the state, I right? remember before the BRI, the, the Chinese bureaucracy, the state was really in despair. Right? And, and then they were re, uh, uh, re revitalized and energetic and was actively participating a kind of national project. And um, that's to the political leadership, to the political system, that's a major outcome. Right? And in terms of um, economic uh, 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 capacity that was uh, uh, eased, um, the, not by sending, uh, not by building these uh, highways abroad or speed rails abroad, that's, that's, that's not going to help much, but rather by uh, stimulating the trade relationship and also by stimulating internal uh, reform process in China. So I uh, uh, observed that um, it kind of resolved some of the most motivating crisis by also creating a new one. And the new one is really, China has, has been doing this state mobilized globalization with reasonable um, comfort uh, for two decades, but they haven't done this on this scale outside, right? So, so the kind of external uh, backlash and pushback um, that was really newly created by, by the BRI. And so again, going back to the, uh, the overall uh, the finding um, is I, I do argue uh, from uh, 1998 in China just uh, uh, came out the Asian financial crisis, it was a, a crisis struck middle power. Uh, and, and through this deep globalization and state mobilization, uh, we, uh, this, this country uh, moved to the uh, superpower that was able to maintain high growth and uh, political stability. Right? So the three strategies I um, cover uh, are these three. So WDP, uh, CGG, and BRI. Uh, and uh, eventually, when you look at the backgrounds, the debates by the um, uh, different uh, bureaucracies in Beijing um, and the pressure that the Beijing's uh, uh, elites faced were 
uh, comparable and industrial overcapacity was always there. You know, that's how move the system uh, toward uh, globalization and market expansion internally or externally, as long as they, they help to resolve the, the, the overcapacity issue. Um, and the rhetoric they employ uh, was very similar, as so I described them as ambition and ambiguity. And so the rhetoric used by the political leadership to promote the national state strategy was very vague. So that kind of uh, allowed and incentivized uh, different actors to, um, to uh, participate uh, and also uh, very ambitious. So mobilize and force different actors to participate as well. But because of the ambiguity allowed these, these uh, Chinese actors to interpret and improvise their own uh, policy programs. So in the, each of these cases, uh, I uh, uh, use the, the state framework and looking at the national level uh, uh, policy uh, and then uh, local level. I, I want to mention that uh, the CDG was very interesting. Right? So the China goes global and the rhetoric is about pushing China outside uh, to acquire uh, overseas markets, to acquire overseas resources and technology. And that kind of, that rhetoric was taken uh, by uh, outside observers as a, as a well-planned uh, strategy. Uh, but in, in truth, um, uh, the, the, the implementation was so fragmented. So I call it uh, the, the, the right? So the, the um, uh, some of the uh, locality, the localities basically were were uh, implementing uh, special zones to attract uh, FDI, right? Not to invest overseas, um, and uh, 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 companies uh, also do lots of uh, self restructuring, right? So, so again, uh, it, it shows that the, the strategy is one thing, but how it's being implemented uh, actually is uh, is a, is a very much decided by these commercial actors, their own concerns. I also want to spend um, uh, highlight uh, one, one, one more thing in the book uh, is uh, in the BRI um, research. Um, so I have a section that's uh, a, a com uh, a, a, a compiling and analyzing all the uh, remarks and documents uh, on the BRI uh, by the, the political uh, leadership and by the bureaucracies or ministries uh, from 2014 to 2016, right? So simple statistics will show that President Xi Jinping uh, is uh, uh, dominating the discourse, right? So 39 over the Li Keqiang's nine uh, remarks and uh, Zhang Gaoli, which, who was the, uh, the chairman of the small leading group um, of the BRI, and then other uh, the permanent uh, standing members of the party bureau, they together only made seven, right? So, so that's, that's very clear, but that, uh, uh, but going through the, 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 the details of the documents, we, we found more information. Uh, number one is uh, 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 Xi's uh, remarks. They are, uh, uh, they, they, they are clear uh, by different audience, the messaging is very different. Uh, the uh, when they when she was speaking to multinational multilateral uh, audience, then it's a uh, very vague um, and very uh, lofty, right? Uh, or even hollow, um, and and so that's where uh, most of outside observers uh, connect uh, BRI with these ideas and. The, uh, terms, but when uh, she was uh, um, speaking in bilateral settings like with another country, then uh, the the, um, the the remarks had a lot more substance. But then the substance you can clearly see that those were fed by the the bureaucracies, right? So the special economic zones or economic corridor or announcements of a particular infrastructure projects, and she. President Xi also spoke to uh, provincial governors, um, and here uh, it's a, the, uh, uh, she 
move them to uh, to uh, implement BRI um, and use uh, financing as as incentives. So primarily, the by the number of the speeches, um, uh, he seemed to be not a very important actor. Uh, but actually, so uh, uh, Lee only talks about one thing, you know, in different form or different occasions, and that's capacity cooperation, right? So that actually is, is very much in line with what we eventually discover the main drama of the, of the BRI implementation outside China, right? But, but Li has two um, directions. Uh, so that's the state, uh, state council has two goals. One is to uh, promote China's uh, uh, competitive industries, the new competitive industries, such as uh, speed rails um, and uh, nuclear uh, power plants. Um, but those, they actually faced a lot of opposition so did not go uh, much, but the the other aspects on the, the excess capacity uh, through trade, uh, trade promotion, special economic zones. Actually, it got uh, a, a lot of headway, and so and then uh, Zhang, uh, as a small uh, lead, uh, 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 leading groups chairman, and his own background was already in charge of regional economic integration, and so the Yangtze River Economic Belt, and uh, the. Uh, the, the Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei, that economic circle, and then uh, uh, more recently, the Greater Bay uh, area development. So this regional development was Zhang's uh, portfolio. So again, putting her, him as a director of the SMG and uh, clearly tries to, um, the uh, BRI, uh, uh, the outside is connected with the inside uh, agenda. And then going to, to the national bureaucracies, then we had uh, three designated uh, regulators, the NDIC in charge of national uh, economy and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the MOFCOM Ministry of Commerce. Um, they, they, uh, uh, their remarks were largely very um, uh, lack of substance. Right? Uh, but then when I look at the other ministries that did not feature as regulators, um, but uh, uh, transportation uh, safe, right? So these actually, they roll out a pre-existing project very quickly and uh, used up their budgets very quickly. You know, transportation is just a very fascinating. Um, they uh, they used up their whole year's budget in a few months. Right? Um, so so that's how they when they have resources when they have budgets they could uh, spend more quickly with uh, with the BRI. And so BRI uh, again this will th th this ends my, my my book right. So when uh, the, the book ends uh, the, uh, before COVID. Right? So lots of things happened in, uh, after. COVID. Um, so uh, the conclusion before then is the, the state mobilized globalization has served as China's rising strategy. But I, I, I don't think the rising strategy as, as initially as a in, in, in expansionist uh, rising strategy, rather it's about uh, 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 the market expansion and uh, um, strengthening the state inside China. And so the, the different strategies and, and how the state uh, play important roles and how the market also play important roles, but they play at different stages uh, of, the, of the strategy. That is the, the, the detailed story that I, I try to unpack in the, in the book. Um, and in terms going back to the Chinese state, right? so we we China scholars uh, have uh, uh, recognized that the Chinese uh, authoritarian system was fragmented, and uh, uh, in general, it was very much commercial led, right? But in the recent in recent years, we um, we constantly feel there's counter trends uh, to this fragmented. Um, system and so uh, the the this this bri uh, book is uh, uh, by looking at in depth uh, policy rhetoric implementation and uh, the actors I, I i still uh, see and very strongly that fragmentation and commercial tendencies are prevailing in china and the policy 
from the top-down rhetoric and to implementation and then feedback adjustment, that cycle uh, it is still very much alive. Right? Um, and then going back to uh, the, the BRI project and many uh, other scholars uh, also uh, recently discovered that these, these BRI projects are deeply linked to China's domestic development um, and uh, they are either in China or have strong connections with Chinese domestic actors. Um, but the, the, the Chinese way, right, so it's a very strong state mobilization, but very intense commercial uh, tendency. And that, that uh, framework uh, is not well matched outside China. Right? So in the book, I in particular, I look at the different uh, state-owned uh, companies and the relationship with the state. That works inside China because they are repetitive players in a in a repeated game, but it does not uh, work outside when, when the transactions is much more um, uh, different. Right? Um, since this is the CWP, so I will share two uh, more recent uh, contemporary uh, 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 writings. Um, and so if you guys have interest, I'm happy to, uh, to, uh, to send to them. Um, uh, so the, the, the first piece uh, was the one that I, uh, re, uh, I, I researched, researched during the COVID period. Right? So uh, the, the, the question is China and uh, uh, the BI and the COVID. Right? Uh, and in the US, we all know that uh, earlier this year, it, it's just a get get very crazy on the, on, on the US-China relations under COVID. Um, so BRI is a big part of that conversation. Right? Um, and there are lots of debates on like whether BRI is in feasible, whether the future trajectory China will be. Um, and so I uh, form, uh, follow the state framework that I um, constructed in the beginning, right? the state, the three block the states, and then you have policy uh, arguments and then policy outcomes. Right? So I, again, uh, going through this uh, uh, the strategic uh, rhetoric and uh, diplomatic rhetoric and uh, economic globalization rhetoric in, in China. Um, and uh, uh, then I also uh, look at uh, the, the, the available reported uh, activities by state agencies, local governments, and state owned companies, as well as the scientists. And uh, I uh, conclude that um, the, the BRI, despite uh, there's so much uh, the resistance and criticism of China but throughout its COVID cycle, and in particular as China was finishing up its, uh, its uh, the, the two sessions right in late May, um, the signals were very clear. Uh, um, the, the BRI still has lots of um, support um, and uh, the, the activities were also continuing on BRI, but adjustments was already done and anticipated. And uh, again, because BRI is China's pro uh, uh, program, um, so they were adjust uh, to the, um, the, the, the conditions in China and uh, outside. Again, the, 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 the other piece, um, they should be available um, uh, online in, uh, in a week or so. Um, so this one is, uh, again, I got very frustrated with US-China relations. Um, and so uh, and, and the, I, I want to uh, synthesize you know, that investigate and exactly how the BRI process tells us about the US-China relations. Uh, and here, actually, I would really uh, uh, like to get comments from foreign policy people and then the foreign all my foreign policy friends are from CWP. Um, so I'm sure there are, the people here can provide a lot of feedbacks. So the, the frustration is the prevalent uh, perspectives. Um, they are all about um, you know, clash would uh, be uh, the, the, the new future, right? So, so cities is trap uh, focusing on the hawkish uh, trends on both sides, US China, and then uh, broadly uh, captured under the clash of civilization is these institutional differences, ideological differences, ideational differences, uh, or cultural differences between the two countries. And then the, um, the uh, people who argue for a peace is actually divided a peace. And so the, 
let's have Cold War and not fight. And that would be the, 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 the minimum um, the expectation or maximum expectation. Um, so I, I find that that's, uh, if the BRI, the process uh, shows there are, there are more positive constructive roles that are played by actors and uh, uh, drivers that are not captured by these perspectives. And so uh, policy professionals, uh, they in different countries, uh, they shape the choices of resistance. So as you can see from the US uh, imposing the TPP uh, uh, and then to China's response with BRI and then with uh, the rise of BRI as China's uh, strategy and the, the US response with uh, FOIP, uh, the free open Indian Pacific strategy. Uh, I see how they treat each other's uh, the, what they perceive as strategic uh, advancement and their, their, their choices uh, are, are shaped by policy professionals. And, and same thing because these uh, different venues, they involve different countries and many sectors uh, linkages. So I feel like the uh, third parties uh, or third countries can play uh, a more stabilizing role. Um, and those, uh, these two uh, forces are really not accounted by the, the prevalent foreign policy uh, arguments. So with that, I'll, I'll end here and thank you so much and I look forward to uh, conversation with you guys. Thank you, Mingya. That was a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate you taking the, uh, the time to speak with us. Um, <clears throat> you, since you ended with um, more information about some of your more recent publications, I wanted to also throw out there that uh, you graciously offered uh, your time to do a podcast with us, the first CWP podcast earlier this summer that talks about some of the issues that you just uh, raised in your forthcoming uh, publication. So if anyone's interested in the follow-up on that, I would recommend uh, them to listen to our podcast that's available on the CWP uh, website. Also a reminder to everybody, um, if they have questions they would like to ask um, Professor Minier, please once again, put them in the comments uh, box for the YouTube uh, live discussion and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. But uh, as I guess moderator, I will kick off the questions with, uh, with my own. Um, how would you respond to those that say that the BRI is simply uh, a synonym for Chinese foreign policy, especially over the last uh, couple of decades? Uh, your discussion is focused on BRI and globalization. More specifically, how, would, uh, how should we be viewing BRI, especially in a, in a COVID world? How has this changed since uh, your book's sort of been published? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, uh, then, should I end the uh, the? I should should I stop share so that uh, we can go back to the main session or keep the slides? Let's leave it up a little bit right now in case anyone wants to copy down uh, your uh, your information or follow okay. your, the website. Okay. Um, so that that's very good uh, uh, question. Um, I, I think so. Most of them uh, see them as foreign policy, and I think I uh, the the uh, the evidence is typically how the um, the Chinese leader uh, uh, talks about the BRI in multilateral settings, um, and uh, and that's even even the, the the leader's own remarks. It it separates out different uh, audience and different messages. So the the, the the foreign policy significance is really is a consumption of to foreign policy uh, observers, right? um, and uh, uh, and also uh, the foreign policy people in China, um, uh, the the uh, the strategic uh, uh, drivers was there. And so when the BRI came out, you do see the, the foreign policy groups uh, uh, latch on this uh, program as well. So you, if you are look, you, if you're out looking for um, foreign policy uh, justifications or evidence, they are, they are, they are, they are plenty. Um, that's because um, this, this BRI thing has become a, a all inclusive uh, strategy and foreign policy actors have also jumped in the process. But if you are a scientist, for example, Nature actually published a five article series looking at the scientists um, 
uh, alliances in the BI. And, uh, and you do see lots of scientists and from academia, like universities, these are the people that I interact more. And, and uh, again, they help presented the BI as their major globalization uh, platform, right? So the, the scholarship, the exchange, the consortium, the science technology uh, alliances, right? Um, so, so you, you the, so with with all that, um, I think uh, it's uh, it's safe to say that it, it includes many things, um, and that's really it, it really uh, precaution or caution against um, that when you study this BRI, um, it, it, it let's not take preconceived. Uh, uh, perceptions yet and and look at the, the projects and look at the, the implementation and look at the actors right um, and this I, I, I really um, the slides I show the rhetoric and reality um, and I think this is becoming more severe during COVID because the, the, the COVID period we can't go somewhere and you can't run into uh, people that can give you different uh, viewpoints and that can correct your misperceptions or your biases. So everything becomes much more um, biased. Uh, and so that's where I, I find the COVID period and I wrote these two in-depth studies of, of, of rhetoric and discursive activities in China and to, and to make myself realize actually things are not as 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 as, as transformatively different from what I know uh, um, as uh, as the media portrays. So again, I know there are lots of uh, excellent scholars, um, and, and but 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 because all of us carry our a, a different uh, pre uh, uh, position, and when we study China, if the goal is to find the truth, then we have to keep open-minded. Makes total sense. Um, I'm going to read one of our first audience questions, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I guess, ending your slideshow so that we can get a larger mm -hmm. image of you and I. Um, a question from Beatrix Xie. Uh, can you talk more about the export of industrial overcapacity? In which sectors is this trend most evident? And mm -hmm. specifically, is there a difference in the response of SOEs and private enterprises to small, to SMGs? Mm -hmm. uh so that's a uh, that's very good a question, and uh, uh, I uh, I do not uh, study these industrial uh, cases per se. Uh, I'll just uh, share um, uh, a couple observations. Uh, uh, number one is, uh, for example, in the, uh, the company um, in the company chapter that I, I did, and then uh, I find that uh, the, um, the the steel company. Right, the steel producers, um, they, 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 they sell more, uh, but, uh, but that's pretty much uh, is, uh, so from, uh, from environmental point of view, actually it's, it's worse for China than, than abroad because production is left in China. It's the product that, that exported abroad. And this is, is actually one important overcapacity uh, elevation um, pattern in China that is a uh, heavy polluting industries uh, they they export more to the BRI countries so so I I, I do have a very uh, uh, very robust study on that um, that uh, the, the polluting industry uh, but the production is inside China so the pollutants actually are inside China and this I would argue in China this is the the backlash that they are they are dealing with domestically they are facing criticism from Chinese environmentalists and economists and the second is a uh, textiles right so this light manufacturing again this this will be very much market driven uh, so the um, the textile companies some of the Chinese textile makers their their markets are primarily domestic so they use BRI to uh, exploit or expand their markets inside China and uh, other are uh, assemblers or uh, processors right so so those already uh, have started uh, shifting their production in Africa Africa, uh, and they are doing more uh, and some of them may uh, shift their products before in Southeast Asia and they are, they are doing more.
more of those. That's that's the light man manufacturers, um, and then you have these uh, power device makers, uh, the kind of heavy uh, um, uh, machinery makers, and and that they are they they do, we do see they try to um, invest uh, uh, factories like solar uh, panel production, power plants, uh, but that I see more in Pakistan than than elsewhere. Uh, so again, uh, the bigger trend actually is two. One is uh, the polluting uh, over capacity, but the, the pollution stays inside China. Um, and then the, the, the labor intensive relocation that already started before BRI. Right, absolutely. So this is uh, another question from Anu Anwar. Uh, could you expand on what you talked before about the China goes west uh, strategic aspects, uh, what exactly does the challenge that China sees in the East and how does BRI, um, is, is that more helpful to solve these issues? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, 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 the uh, WDP uh, was interesting, right? So they uh, uh, started uh, in 1998 to address the Asian financial crisis uh, and uh, as well uh, as the difficulties uh, of the domestic market. And so they, they try to address many things. And I, I would really encourage, uh, would be happy to share the, the chapter. It's, it's really interesting to see the background. Um, but the, the more interesting aspect is uh, uh, the, the first phase uh, to 1999 to 2003. So basically it's the national bureaucracies used the WDP to uh, integrate the national economy and to ring in the provincial governments because China um, uh, had uh, the, the provinces had, were very powerful uh, compared to the bureaucracies. So the, the WDP was their opportunities to not only um, uh, integrate Western markets into uh, uh, the, the national market, but more is to control the coastal provinces as well. And so the projects, uh, 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 provincial uh, uh, coastal provinces were pushing, they had the uh, WDP to, to kind of you know, shut them down. And we had WDP will do this. Right? Um, but then it's uh, the, the, the interesting uh, part is when uh, the new leader came and the new leader was not interested in this national economic planning um, or she, he did not have the capacity to really focus on the national economic planning. And so he, he promoted like social environment. So the, the WDP, the, the budget and the focus were changed without changing the name. Right. And then the, um, the uh, global financial crisis occurred uh, in uh, 2008. And, when, and then the, when uh, Sichuan, the earthquake occurred, so mo the, 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 newly, the stimulus were actually really poured into the, 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 CWP, uh, the, the, the WDP. And, and then be we begin to see these state-owned companies and then they, now they suddenly had lots of money. So they, they actually constantly penetrate into the local politics. And I also had this connection and how they work with BRI and, and again, continuously fragmenting the projects at the provincial level. Um, the most, the comment I had is very recent, right? So the COVID happened uh, and uh, then the, uh, the Chinese trade with merit time uh, on the uh, with the United States really declined um, and uh, so they, they have two things they want to work on one is a trade on the land you know that that they had uh, uh, the railway con connection that are, are ongoing and so that's one way that they are promoting the, the Western development program again in China it's called internal circulation so now they had this dual circulation so external circulation plus internal circulation um, so driving up domestic consumption. So they're both for domestic consumption, but, but also uh, on the land, the connectivity is taking precedence over the maritime connectivity. Another question, um, have, uh, how have relations for BRI partner company or countries with uh, China been impacted as a byproduct of uh, COVID-19? Uh, is globalization sort of in general at risk? Uh, and more specifically, is the BRI um, going to have any sort of fallout from sort of you know, re relations with any of these countries as a byproduct? Yeah, so 
uh, I, I'm still doing uh, several uh, uh, the, the Chinese materials I haven't finished uh, analyzing. Um, uh, but from up until June, and uh, uh, there, there are a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, uh, overall China's external environment deteriorated after COVID. Right? Uh, so it's one is China was, uh, was the first uh, pandemic epicenter. And so that, that, that they got lots of blame for that. Uh, but also domestic politics in almost every other country is uh, deteriorated against China. Uh, but, but the BRI countries uh, seem to be uh, more benign than the non-BRI countries. So we begin to see the bifurcation of the, the, the democratic-led uh, uh, alliance versus the BRI alliance. And then coming back to the BRI itself, uh, so far, the, um, uh, the during the COVID period, and the, the, the because of the lots of uh, financial challenges and uh, and rethinking of those costly uh, uh, infrastructure projects, uh, both in in China and uh, in the partner countries. So we begin to see this softer, like a scientist research vaccine uh, uh, studies and, and the digital and, the, uh, and education. So digital Silk Road uh, uh, took a more uh, precedent. And even the now the WDP, for example, as I say, the WDP now is what China is doing, the new infrastructure. So it has a lot more digital digital uh, projects uh, 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 to replace the, the harder infrastructure. So outside, it's the same. So they're trying to promote the, the digital programs and e-commerce. And second is uh, um, the, uh, the health uh, Silk Road, again, driven by the, the, the pandemic. So the health Silk Road uh, has been uh, emphasized. And of course, before the health Silk Road were there, but they did not get good uh, commercial interests. Right? So they had these uh, research uh, scientists, uh, doctors, uh, medical schools, they showed interest in doing the health BI. But the, the, the industries, the companies, uh, the, um, the business, they, they haven't found the, the opportunity. So now it looks like they find that there, there are opportunities in the health sector. So the, the, the commercial tendency is, is rising. Um, but then I also think uh, as, as the COVID effects are ending, on um, the uh, hard infrastructure is likely to revive. So uh, at least the, 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 the Pakistan, the CPAC is, re, uh, many of the projects are restarting and uh, the Chinese projects in Southeast Asia, many of them are restarting. Right? So with COVID ending, I think the hard infrastructure might uh, are less important, but uh, many of them will re, re, restart. That makes a lot of sense. We have another question from the uh, German China Forum. Do you think path dependency plays a key role in the approach of BRI or the so-called SMG, state to mobilize globalization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very uh, uh, good uh, question. Um, so so the, the, the Chinese is used to the SMG. Right. Um, and so that's why when they did the BRI, it quickly assumed this state uh, mobilization, but active and fragmented uh, market actors and going around. Uh, but outside China, they are not used to this, 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 uh, this, this standard operation. Uh, so they are uh, creating uh, 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 problems, challenges, backlash. So I think China is learning. So in a way, um, I think the Chinese uh, from the, the one of the driver or the more tacit, but I think more significant long-term driver is really the Chinese elites, their, 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 their innate needs and aspiration to be more global. Right? and to play bigger roles on the global stage. And yet they didn't know how to do it, right? So the BRI is a process that they, they learn uh, the, where they did wrong and where they did right, right? And so, so from this point of view, it, this, there's, it's not going to fail because you know, it's, it's testing out um, uh, the problems because Chinese own way is just very different from the external way. Yes, that makes sense. Another question from uh, Iram Ashraf. 
Recently, there have been talks about a slowdown in BRI projects and loans from banks in China, independent of COVID-19. Um, what are your observations? That's a, actually, so uh, in my previous talks, I, 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 I think I, I mentioned to you before, uh, the, the decline in projects and in financing uh, started in 2017, right? So China's outbound investment peaked in 2017, and then 2018, 19, it was, it was a sharp job. And then that, 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 that's fine because uh, the recipients, they had a more uh, offer, right, out of competition or out of the visibility, right? So they had a counter bid as well. On the other hand, China its own it itself does not have as much uh, resources available to, to spend. Um, so statistics, you do see the job starting 2017 and uh, uh, policy uh, rhetoric and the framework, you also see the moderation um, uh, from 2017 to 2019, right? very clear moderation. Uh, but I think the Chinese would argue, and I agree on this one, they still think this moderation is good. Uh, it, it fits the, the reality. Again, the, their uh, uh, um, uh, discourse is that the BR is just a platform. China does not have like a, a, a set agenda they have to achieve. And maybe it's a, it's just political uh, shrewdness, right? So they do not try to set up the, the measurements uh, so that they can always claim uh, a successful uh, process, right? Uh, but that has been the Chinese way. So if we help think about Chinese way, is they don't really give out very clear as, uh, uh, scorecards that this is successful, this is unsuccessful. Unsuc Rather, it takes much more open-ended views. Absolutely. Well, I think we're actually getting near the uh, the end of uh, of our time. We should probably begin to to wrap up. I do want to plug uh, your your book once again, and thank you very much for taking the time to help us understand China's emphasis on BRI and how the world sees this initiative. Um, if uh, unless there's anything else, uh, thank you all for joining us today. This is uh, we're signing off from the China in the World program. My name is Daniel Sahansky, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Dan. Yeah.